Hello, welcome to our session on the digitization of the credit process to strengthen our decision making. Um, I'm Judith, head of capital markets for State Guru, and to my left is Andres, uh, chief risk officer, and we also have Stefan, who is the head of German credit, and Michael, who is the head of UK credit risk. And some background on the company: the company to date um, is well established, been around for since 2013, and we've funded about 578 million of loans, of which 14 months uh, on average in duration, and about 60% LTV. Quite granular as well, about 3,728 loans. I think taken into the above, perhaps given our, the history and track record, we'd like to maybe cover how we can use technology as an underwriting tool. So. How are we using technology to aid our underwriting process? Are we a scorecard lender, or do we actually review the borrowed collateral in detail? And the second question being, how could technology aid in asset management and mitigating late loans and losses? And perhaps, Andre, you can cover that, uh, that question from a uh, corporate perspective, and then perhaps the guys can pitch in. So thank you. Um uh, to answer your question, firstly, we are not the scorecard lender. Yes, we have um, uh, developed an online credit application system with our in-house IT team. And um, we have now integrated different service providers into this system. For instance, we are using extensively different uh, credit bureaus uh, to assess uh, and analyze the financial statements, payment remarks, and depths of the borrower. Also, we do um, background checks using their services. Um, when we look at the collateral, then we have integrated um, uh, quite uh, strong automated valuation providers, for instance, Scenario Labs, Idealista, and also Priceable. So uh, we are using them to analyze the collateral to give us a second opinion about the valuation. And of course, uh, when we look at the um, first part of the credit analysis, we have different real estate uh, market data providers, uh, and we are using them to do the initial market research. So uh, uh, on top of that, we have in every country a dedicated uh, credit officer who is manually checking all the applications, and of course, uh, we have local legal partners, in-house legal uh, partners who are also pitching in for the analysis. And um, what we have now done is that um, we have um, uh, gone into the traditional three lines of defense model. So the first line are the loan managers and they of course are also helping with the due diligence. So they may make the first picks and uh, meet the borrowers and, and also uh, propose the application to our credit officers who then make the final decisions. Okay. So in a sense, you're saying that we're using technology to leverage our capabilities um, in yes. underwriting. Yes. And perhaps there's some new nuances in different jurisdictions as well. So perhaps, Stefan, you can talk about um, how are you using the technology for your underwriting in Germany? Yeah. So. In general, we use uh, online uh, access to trade register or credit offices or land registers to, to assist us in, in uh, acquiring the key facts of a pro project and, and what the property is uh, about and what the project is about, and also to, to better check the track record of the borrower that we have. But uh, I would say as a percentage, like 50% of this is being uh, gathered online and another 50% of, of what we, or how we assess the project is being gathered by personal contact to the borough and also by on-site visits to the project and to the area where it is located. So um, in general, I, I would say it's a people business and uh, to meet the borough in person, to meet him in his office, to have him with the, us and, and uh, speak about the project and how we can go forward. Okay, that's very good. And Michael, I mean, I know the UK is just starting out and hitting the ground running. Um, what are your general thoughts in, in terms of using technology and underwriting as well? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, like, like you say, we, we are kind of uh, 
on the launch pad waiting to take off here in the UK. But having just joined the company at the beginning of the year and, and my background, I've uh, worked for lenders where we've been heavily automated and it's been very scorecard and, and very rigid uh, in terms of the automated decision making. Um, and I've experienced the frustration as, as somebody who, you know, thinks outside the box where you have a good borrower with a, a good deal and you, you just aren't able to get it through the credit process because it's so rigid. I've also worked for uh, a lender that's been extremely kind of manual and very um, human decision making based, which, which I love. But um, as a manager, that, that comes with some inefficiencies. Um, and I think what we're trying to build here at Estate Guru is something that blends the best of, of both those world, worlds, where we're using technology to speed up the process, to help us make more robust credit decisions, but at the same time, we're keeping that kind of human element to be able to think outside the box and um, you know, treat each deal and each borrower in, in its kind of unique uh, characteristics. And I think that gives us uh, an advantage in the space as well. Um, and I guess uh, to touch on, on what we're doing in the UK, um, we are using the APIs that we've got through um, the platform, which are used uh, European-wide, so using that for credit reference checks. Certainly in the UK, we'll also credit reference check the, uh, the UBOs and the directors as well uh, to ensure that they're credit worthy. Um, we've also got the, uh, through the company, we use uh, the analytics tools to analyze the financials and, and kind of have a, a borrower rating based on those financials. Um, but in terms of the partners we're using, um, both on the valuation side and the solicitor side, we're, we're working with partners who've got technology platforms that we can leverage that essentially we can use to instruct um, the due diligence on the solicitor side instruct the valuation um, and then monitor that through to completion and it just means that we can track it and that it's very efficient and, and speedy basically so I guess it's, it's trying to make uh, the best of, of both worlds which uh, I'm really keen to, to get here in the UK as we launch. Okay so that's that summarize that I guess you're using the, the best of both worlds and I suppose on the asset management side as well you know we have alerts um, with our payment systems that provide sort of alerts on, on, on those sorts of things. So um, I think that maybe perhaps is a good segue to talk about our portfolio today. And, um, you know, Andres, perhaps you can talk about, um, you know, your, your views on what's going on with the portfolio, the outstanding loans and, and so on. So since 2013, like you said, in the beginning, we have originated nearly 600 million worth of loans. Currently, outstanding amount is 250 million euros. And uh, currently, our uh, outstanding uh, default rate is uh, um, slightly over 5% of this outstanding amount. And uh, basically, we also monitor the late loans, uh, and this is currently just below 20%. Uh, we have recovered nearly 20 million euros worth of loans. Currently outstanding is over 10. And uh, throughout the years, uh, we have basically uh, recovered uh, loans with the uh, average yield of 9%. And the workout time has been uh, 10 months. So uh, current portfolio status is, uh, now when we take into account the macroeconomic situation, uh, then it's quite good, but of course we need to put uh, lots of efforts uh, in talking to the borrowers and uh, getting the loans back on, on the right time. Uh, also, uh, what I can add is that uh, Germany takes most of the portfolio. Uh, Germany has now grown, grown very rapidly over the uh, last year. So over 30% of the outstanding portfolio is Germany. And, um, and the second large, largest is our main market, Estonia, and then come, comes the rest. So we have financed uh, typically um, uh, development loans and bridge loans, but also some parties, business loans. But I see that as we are uh, entering UK, then the bridge loan part will increase definitely as the markets differ. Uh, and, and the demand for breach uh, financing is higher, for instance, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, perhaps, Stefan, you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, your, I mean, Germany in general, you know, the kind of 
yields and LTVs, you know, that you've seen. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. So um, we we try to be very conservative regarding uh, risk level and loan to value ratios. So we we rarely ever see uh, any uh, loan to value ratio about uh, or above seventy uh, percent. You'd rather keep it around like fifty to sixty percent, which I think is very conservative. Uh, and uh, this should give enough headroom in, in any case, if any case should in the future go, go bad. Um, and apart from that, uh, I think the, the interest rate or the yield would be starting from 9% up to uh, 10, 11, 12%, depending on the risk uh, assessment that we do on the case. And it's adjusted to, to what risk we see in the, uh, the project, and we want to have the, the yield aligned with the risk. Okay, that's interesting in terms of pricing for risk. Yes. And so, Michael, perhaps you can talk about the UK appetite, <laughs> speaking about pricing for risk. Yeah, so we don't have a portfolio yet. Um, hopefully we will soon, and hopefully we're going to start um, overtaking uh, Germany and maybe Estonia one day. Um, but yeah, I think we really want to take a controlled approach to how we launch in the UK. Um, you know, obviously we, we want to do um, large volumes in time, but I think Certainly, the first year we, we're looking to, towards a smaller appetite around development, especially with the, the kind of economic risks that we're we'll maybe going to talk about later. Um, so we, we've limited our loan size, which is, is lower than it is elsewhere in the company. Um, so we're not really looking to do more than around 5 million maximum in the UK. We want to limit our development portfolio in terms of volume to a maximum of 30%. In terms of actual loans, it will be much, much lower than that. Um, and we really want to build a strong portfolio of, of good, pretty straightforward vanilla bridging as much as we can. Um, we've got, I guess, a team that we feel that can deliver that because we've got great relationships out in the market um, that hopefully means that we can source the right kind of deals to build a really strong portfolio. Um, and then I guess in, in subsequent years and as the, as the business matures, we'll be looking to do you know, more development and higher value loans as, as we kind of find our feet. Excellent. And, um, you know, I think uh, obviously, you know, we, when the money goes out the door, sometimes you have some issues. So I think uh, what kind of approach do you think we have in terms of addressing late loans? You know, what, what, do you, what is the process? I mean, perhaps, Andres, you can talk about that in terms of what you do from a corporate perspective. And so we have established um, a group uh, credit process to deal with late loans, and, and we have uh, uh, basically uh, use this as a template for other for all of the countries but of course uh, different countries have different uh, rules uh, different problems so we have adjusted this group policy uh, currently uh, we have uh, in every country uh, in-house operational specialist who is uh, dealing with the late loans after our system has notified and asked for repayment. Uh, then uh, in some countries, for instance in Latvia, we use also external debt collectors in the first phase. Uh, but uh, we try to communicate with the borrowers in up to 45 days late in-house and then we will approach our external partners who can uh, take over and, and maybe mm, find a more better solution for the repayment. Okay. And um, so, Stefan, are there any certain nuances in Germany? Or are you pretty much within the corporate sort of way of approach of doing it? Yes, yes, I think so. And, and maybe to add this, so we, we also have a German a servicer who can assist us in, in late loan cases, for example, and who can start from debt collection even to, to maybe take over loans if we want to. Uh, and apart from that, we try to do as much as ourselves as we can. So as soon as we see uh, like uh, any interest uh, payment is being laid, then we have our operation specialist and I try to, to assist. And uh, I will also take part in uh, negotiations or in, in talks with borrowers and to, to find out what's going on and, and how we can solve the problems if there are any. Yeah. Okay, that's excellent. And then I guess, you know, there's a theme here with local <laughs> partners. So perhaps, Michael, you can talk about, uh, you know, how that works in the UK and how, how that would work in the UK. So. 
Yeah, so I mean, very similar. We're following the kind of the company structure uh, de- in terms of how we deal with uh, late loans initially and how we deal with that first ninety day process. Um, and we do, we will try and discuss with the borrower and, and kind of come to a, a settlement that, that suits both parties. Um, but along those lines, one of the things we're looking at currently is finding an auction partner, whereby before defaulting the customer, we can encourage the customer to sell via auction which basically means that we recover the funds quicker with less litigation and cost, mm-hmm. and the borrower doesn't get a default on their credit file, so it kind of comes to the best solution for, for both parties. Um, once it reaches the stage where we do have to go into to litigation and recovery, we're in talks with a, a really strong UK partner that I've used in, in previous places that I've worked. Actually got very lucky, he contacted me just as I was coming to the, the uh, stage of trying to find a, a good partner for it. Um, and we've obviously procured that amongst uh, other potential partners, but we are pretty much at the final DD stage of, of signing off that agreement. What we haven't decided yet is whether they're just going to buy the debt, which is obviously a quicker solution, but may impact the amount we recover, or if they're going to uh, implement the litigation strategy for us. Okay, well, we'll see. And then in terms of the um, uh, delinquencies, I guess, you know, are we experiencing increased delinquencies and losses in certain jurisdictions? I mean, obviously, you know, it doesn't take much to read the papers and what's going on these days. So perhaps, Andres, you can talk about that from your point of view and, and, and what you've seen across the group. So when we look uh, the past, past few years, then we have had COVID crisis and now we have this uh, Ukrainian war. So after these incidents, uh, we saw uh, increase in late loans. Uh, fortunately, our portfolio has been quite strong. So uh, no increase in defaults, but of course, uh, late loans for the past uh, two or three months have gone up. Uh, and uh, I think in, from March, we have uh, had many discussions with borrowers who have been impacted by the Ukrainian war through their tenants, suppliers. And yeah, unfortunately, the increase has, uh, has been ha- happening with late loans. But of course, we are uh, in communication with them daily, basically, and trying to find the solutions. And, and I think patience is here the key. We, we shouldn't uh, rush into default, into litigation, just to give them time to, uh, to find new s- supply chains, new tenants, and, and, uh, and not go into default, because defaults take time and are, like Michael said, quite uh, costly mm-hmm. for, for our Right. Well, we, I think there's an understood in the credit world that's always work with the borrower for the best recovery rate, and I think we do that as a group. And in terms of that, you know, what kind of time frames do you apply to your loans? Um, you know, in terms of late loans, defaults, and the recovery process. Perhaps you have a strict guideline on how that works. Uh, yes. So typically, loan is late uh, for up to 90 days, and uh, throughout this time period, our system sends. After three days late, the first notification, then after one week late, then we call the borrower uh, and up to 30, 45 days late, uh, our operation specialist or loan manager or credit officer is in contact with the borrower. And after that, we turn to our external partners or try to sell the claim or find find another solution. Uh, So basically, this is the general view and, and the steps that we have uh, across the group. And, um, you know, in terms of recovery, I mean, what is it possible to get, or, you know, both in principal and interest? I mean, I think, you know, we've seen varying cases across different institutions, at least I worked at, uh, where that's quite different. But from your point of view, what do you see? Yes, as our historical average LTV is uh, below 60%, and we have now recovered uh, nearly 20 million worth of loans, we have seen that uh, principal plus uh, on average 10% uh, yield annually is doable. Uh, for the last two years, it has been over 12% on average. And uh, if you look at our historical loss rate, then only two loans uh, have ended with the small insignificant capital loss so uh, it's it's not even a number i think so okay well that's actually very impressive but uh, understanding that sometimes you know within different jurisdictions it does take might take more time than others but understandably yes 
And then I think a more interesting devi deviation around this is uh, the country's culture. I mean, every different European jurisdiction um, has an impact. And when the bar is under stress, you know, perhaps you can, I think it'd be good to, to explore with the, with the, the audience in terms of uh, where you see some interesting nuances on, on, on cultural nuances on bar behavior. Andres. Uh, so, for instance, in Finland, uh, we have seen that um, there is no use of external debt collect collection agency because they are quite passive and the borrowers uh, don't uh, want to hear them. And, and basically, we have found out that uh, we need to be aggressive there, which means that uh, we need to send out warning letters, termination letters, and get the case to court as soon as possible to get the auction notice. So this has been a learning curve for us that Finnish market, uh, basically the negotiations with the borrower don't lead to anything and we need to get the litigation ongoing. Uh, but in other markets, I think the Baltic market uh, works quite good. The systems are quite uh, efficient uh, and uh, our security agent can basically prepare the documents for the bailiff and we can start the auction in less than two months, so it's it's very easy. But uh, the most of the deals with, which we have made with the borrowers have uh, have been in the Baltic. So the borrowers there, I think, uh, are more willing to negotiate mm. because they have invested equity and also we take the personal guarantee always, so they are liable for, for their own worth so or assets. So so this helps us to bring them and and talk to us. Yeah, oh, very good. And then I think, I mean, sort of German culture, perhaps, Stefan, you can allude to what goes on there. Yeah, so um, I would say is in general, the, uh, our borrowers, they, they stick to what is agreed. And, and this is good, of course, for, for us and for, for the investors. Um, I think what is an issue maybe for, for us and for the investors and for the borrowers might be that the level of digitization in Germany is not as high as in other countries, like in Estonia, for example. Um, so it might be that depending on the state where, where you want to register a mortgage, it, it might take, uh, for example, four weeks in, in Hamburg, but maybe eight weeks or 12 weeks in Berlin, just uh, very much depending on the public offices and on the current uh, state where you're in. So this might be an issue maybe to, to hinder us from getting more speedy uh, and, and uh, processes. So I think this is maybe an issue that we only can solve ourselves in parts. Mm -hmm. and, and this is also maybe relating to German culture. And I hope just because of the pandemic even uh, that the level of digitization go goes up further and further. And I think we could have a good example in the Baltic states for this. Great, that's wonderful. And then Michael, I guess on the UK side, I mean, clearly um, borrower behavior in the UK it's always very interesting to talk about the UK. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very different. I think um, one thing I've learned from working in European lenders, this one and previous ones, is that the UK has a very mature financial services industry. Um, and I think what, what comes along with that is a really robust legal system that really is in the benefit of, of the lender, um, which the borrowers are aware of. Um, and they also have um, credit reference agencies where a lot of data is exposed and shared. Um, so borrowers are very conscious that essentially, if um, we followed our correct processes in terms of due diligence and securitization, that they don't really have much recourse. Um, so they tend to be very willing to work with us. Uh, I think probably the main risk with UK borrowers is the KYC part, knowing your customer, because because the process is robust, the key is that we, we've got the right customer, that it's not fraudulent, that they haven't left the country, um, providing they are still in the country and, and we've, we've done all of our KYC correctly, um, then really the, the system is, is very advantageous to us. And to touch on, I guess, what Stefan said about the German courts taking a long time to implement that receivership, uh, in the UK you've got LPA receivership if you uh, have a uh, first charge against the asset. So it's really, you know, you can essentially take the keys to the property and have it in auction in a week if, yeah. you, if you're quick and you've got a good, uh, you know, if, if uh, you've lodged everything correctly. So, um, yeah, we, we don't have that issue. Um, but I guess it's, it's a matter of not necessarily wanting to go down that route unless we have to because we want to work with the borrowers. But I think culturally um, it's very much in the lender favour in this country. Okay. Well, that's good to know. 
Um, and then, I mean, I think Stefan talked about, um, and uh, Andres mentioned as well, I mean, we've, in terms of risks and, um, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, Andres more specifically, um, at the moment, you know, the Eurozone inflation is now 8.1%. And, uh, you know, it's a record high. And also in the Baltics, you know, the double digits, you're talking about, you know, 15% um, roughly in, in Lithuania and Estonia, about 14%. Um, and then the UK, UK C, CPI at 9%. Um, you know, all these things impact, you know, our underwriting. So perhaps let's discuss that. You know, let's discuss how, you know, mitigate that in terms of our underwriting and short-term lending. Um, in terms of a construct, cost of construction and exit values. Perhaps, Andres, you can talk about that from a corporate perspective and what you're putting into policy. And perhaps uh, the guys can also chime in. Yes, so what we have done is now that uh, every development loan uh, which includes construction uh, we have partnered with the construction supervisors and architects who basically uh, analyze every project that comes in uh, and uh, they assess the budget they assess the inputs the labor estimations the, the materials and we also always ask uh, two competitive offers for the budget uh, what we also demand is a cost overrun buffer from the borrower, so equity needs to be in place. And we, during the life uh, time of the loan, will monitor uh, with on-site visits, uh, visits from construction supervisors, evaluators, uh, daily basically the progress uh, of, the, of the construction works. So here I can see that um, of course, the construction inputs have risen, but uh, not uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, maybe some inputs, uh, steel, wood, and, uh, and even if the total costs have risen 10%, then also the end prices of the final product, uh, apartments, uh, commercial premises, have also gone up. And as the demand is still strong, as you know that uh, across Europe we have housing crisis, so, so then uh, we still see quite good pre-booking levels and, and um, consumers are buying the properties uh, from our borrowers. Okay, that's, thank you very much. And Stefan, perhaps you can talk about what happens in, in Germany. Um, you know, are there, is it slightly different nuance there? Or perhaps you can add to... Yeah, so, so what I think what we see is still, at least in large cities, that is still high demand for residential uh, properties and it's still ongoing. So um, we don't see any decrease in, in values there. And also what, what Andres mentioned, we, uh, in, in any case, we have valuators who are certified and who give us a sustainable value of market value for, for the property that we are financing. So this should also reflect any uh, ups and downs in the past and, and also leave a you know, com comfortable uh, cushion or, or uh, buffer for so what, what we've seen as a market valuation is, is not overly high or whatever so it's rather uh, low valuation or com conservative valuations that we receive and we want to uh, avoid any speculative valuations so whatsoever. I mean, in that vein, Stefan, I mean, you know, do you have a lot of appetite for development lending at this point of view in Germany? Do you? Yeah, so I, I think we, yeah, we, we mix it into our portfolio, but we would try to have it only around like 10 to 15 percent, maybe on average. And also we need to uh, differ differentiate between um, total um, works from ground uh, or if we have like an existing building that is um, being refurbished or restructured or something. So um, yeah, so we, we look into different levels of, of uh, development here, and we would rather like um, rich finance an existing property than that we look into development fi development financing, just because of the imminent risk. Uh, also, if you see material prices rising or maybe not enough uh, workforce uh, that could come to the construction site and so on, so these are risks that we cannot even uh, influence, and, and yeah, so we would rather to bridge financing maybe more than others. And maybe I can add that uh, most of our portfolio is related to residential mm -hmm. properties, which is more resilient to, to any of the shocks, external shocks or rather shocks. So, so 
I think this this has been quite a good uh, learning point from the last uh, financial crisis that oh, uh, residential is better as a collateral. Slightly more robust. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And as with the housing shortage, that's uh, actually quite helpful yeah. as well. I mean, perhaps Mike, we can comment briefly about, um, you know, your thoughts around that. Yeah, I mean, just to, I guess, touch on your summary of the economic clouds, as so to speak, is there's, there is silver linings to a lot of them, um, even though obviously inflation is really high. We've also got record employment at the moment, so that kind of offsets that. Um, you know, while there are some grey clouds around um, perhaps the, the stock market and the bond market and, and perhaps the real estate market in, in the short term, the long term trend in the UK is that houses have been going up 4.3% per year in the last decade. Um, I mean, I saw a stat the other day that house building has halved in the last 50 years. The population has gone up 32%. So that housing shortage isn't, isn't going anywhere. Um, and I think that that's going to ensure that certainly the residential side of the market is going to be very, very resilient to any shocks that we see coming forward. That being said, um, we still need to kind of have our eyes open and pick the right projects, uh, limit our LTVs. A bit like what Stefan was saying in terms of using um, qualified value, valuers that we can trust, um, ensuring that those kind of market factors have been included when we're looking at future values, um, being um, restrictive around our LTVs in, in certain areas, certain markets, certainly around the commercial sector. Um, but I think there is you know, a drive in the UK to build 300,000 house, homes a year. They're currently at two thirds of that, and, and we do want to support that where we can. So I think, from my perspective, it's it's really around finding the right development deals, um, and these the banks as they start you know turning away some of these good deals because they're tightening their belts gives an opportunity for us to pick up some of that stuff, and just to outline kind of the things that I'd be looking at in order to mitigate that risk of, of uh, costs going up. I've got mates in construction who are on the phone to me regularly complaining about how much their costs are going up. Um, But I'd be looking for fixed contracts. I'd be getting the solicitors to do due diligence on them to look for break clauses. I'd be looking at the uh, financial viability of those contractors as well. Um, And really looking for the developers to have long term relationships with those contractors. And it's it's ways of thinking like that that a lot of the banks can't do. And And I think that's where we've kind of got an opportunity to find the right things and to support that 300,000 home a year target that the UK desperately needs. Right. Well, that's, thank you for that. Um, well, I mean, going back to the, the you mentioned something about banks and, um, you know, um, I think maybe quite a few banks are maybe pulling back in, in terms of development lending and other types of lending. I mean, do you see this as an opportunity, Andres? Perhaps you can Yes, I can see. And as you know, that our company, State Corp, was established after the last financial crisis where banks were out of the market and our founders uh, uh, saw that there are still good projects on the market. Demand was high, but banks basically, it was raining, but banks took uh, took away the umbrella. Mm -hmm. So it's always a good time for our type of business where we are more uh, flexible. Uh, We drill down. To the projects, uh, we just don't say no, a quick no, but we meet, uh, analyze, and, and see what the property is, what the collateral is, and, and uh, how demand uh, is basically in the market. So, so I think it's a good opportunity to grow our business and, and take, take the market share away from banks. Great. Well, good, that's very good. I think um, that covers quite a lot already in terms of our workout regime and asset management and technology. I thought maybe we segue into, you know, anecdotal stories or funny stories about what happens in credit because um, I'm working in different banks over 30 years. I've had some real good ones. So perhaps, uh, you know, Andres, you could talk about one of yours and we can go around the table to see, uh, you know, what our views are. <laughs> so I have two stories. Um, the first uh, story is about uh, when I started as a Great officer at the state corps, so uh, <coughs> we needed to act uh, quickly to basically seize the collateral. And, and as the bailiff was on, a vac- on vacation, then he basically gave us uh, power of attorney to go to the property. And of course, the borrowers was there. But uh, fortunately, it was uh, uh, quite a friendly borrower, so we got the property seized. 
Uh, another story is uh, when we uh, got the court order uh, to enter the property as we wanted to make new pictures for the auction and then uh, bailiff uh, received the order we called the locksmith uh, and uh, when we entered the apartment then there were two poker players sleeping so <laughs> the borrower uh, rented out the property uh, oh. but didn't let us in so but so collected the winnings from that probably yeah. okay and um perhaps michael um, well, not me, uh, but a lender I know um, <laughs> once uh, lent 75% loan to value using a desktop valuation. So I guess this is where you can see the benefits and the risks of using technology and not being actually in touch with the, the collateral and the borrower. Um, so they lent 75% LTV and it subsequently turned out that the property didn't exist and it had been demolished. So, uh, oh, that's nice. Yeah, so that was a that was a lesson around uh, mm. making sure that you've got photos of the collateral. Maybe Visiting somebody somebody visits it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so lesson learned there for okay. that person I know. Okay, well then, maybe Stefan, anything to comment? Uh, yeah. So so uh, I have a funny story, but it's like more than ten years ago when I used to work for a bank and also in the private consumer sector and and um, real estate financing for for private uh, and um, persons. Uh, so we asked them for a development financing for current photos of the project and then obviously there was a misunderstanding because they sent new photos of themselves uh, of the boroughs <laughs> so uh, so th this didn't help much so we we yes yeah, so yeah right so we we sent an appraiser to make photos of the property okay <laughs> very interesting well i guess that rounds up our uh, our credit discussion um thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for just seeing.